Hi fellas, Leo's here. See, I have a dilemma. I have money, but I don't want to spend it on. Damn it! I bought both! Wasn't even worth it! Two buttons, a d-pad, that's all you need. You jump and shoot and die and die and die some more. What else do you need? Yup, this was dreadful. But I don't despise it or even regret it. Pretty much everyone knows this, but back in the day when video games were still niche, you wouldn't invest so much money on a bunch of cartridges without knowing if you were getting shanked. Very, very slowly. That's why companies had to make the game feel worthwhile, not just because of that one experience, but also any subsequent one tied to your name. That's how Capcom and Konami became such big household names during the NES and SNES era. The replay value had to be big, so your game had to be fun all the way through. You didn't want that refund money to give you trouble, did you? Beat it. Players had to feel connected and appreciate what they had. Or you could just give up. Yeah, there was the second option. Insulting your client. Wait, you wanna play? Well, quick question. Are you a little pussy? Wait, but I'm not a pussy. That's what a pussy would say. And that's how they get you. It's funny because there are games that are beloved because they are tough and fun like the Contra games or even Castlevania for the really... Eh? What the hell is wrong with you, man? Is that a mustache or two tears kissing? You tell me. But then there are those that even though they are fun, the legacy exists mostly because of how brutal they are even to this day. One of the biggest examples? Battletoads, made by Rare. Oh, I love Rare. I'm glad Microsoft bought you. It pretty much became a challenge to go past the first few stages, let alone the whole game, or even worse. That's why I have a deep level of respect for not only speedrunners, but also those that actually beat the game without getting hit. Which led us onto Ninja Gaiden. No. One thing is getting pushed back in Castlevania, but this one has barely any floor in it. They're still pouring the slap! And also the amount of enemies and one of the worst things that I just, I mean, ever. Right, hear me out. I got an idea. What if we add enemies? Yeah, but that's already done. No, but I mean, we add them again. Oh, sh what the f? Well, that's his lead. No, no, no. Hold on. Keep going. And that is the story of the first registered heart attack. And let's not forget one of the most infamous cases of games that were put on ice for years because of how tough they were. Japanese Mario 2. Not only has invisible blocks before Kaizo blocks were even a thing, but also has the wind hazard, just horrible enemy positions, and this stupid ass jump to get to level 83. Yeah, you know what? Bring in this Mario 2? Good call. As I mentioned earlier, it wasn't easy to decide which game to invest your hard earned money into, and that's when the rental business broke its way into the family's wiki expenses. Blockbuster and Etc. became a huge business back in the day when word of mouth wasn't fast enough, only the game label and recommendation from the store clerk were going to push you into renting a game. Most likely it would be something terrible if everything else was taken, but sometimes you get the high school experience. Man, I got f Not for how bad the game was, but because you can't even get past the first level. And that's when it went from beat it to Yo, what the f man? It was a rumor for decades, but in recent years, some developers confirmed that certain games were developed to be difficult enough so kids wouldn't beat them on the first try and they would have to rent them over and over. One of the most infamous examples, The Lion King. In my case, the SNES version. I call this a trick game. Not because it's got tricks, which it does, but because it lures you into a false sense of security during the first stage. After that, man, the gloves were off and the brass knuckles were in. Tiny ass hitboxes in the first instance of quick time events. And it only got worse from there. At least you can use cheats if you wanna be a bitch about it and skip the whole game, but back then, man, Cine wasn't on the table. This is a religious family and we can only afford one game. Sadly, because of this, when people look back on Disney games for the SNES, we always fondly remember the Capcom games like Aladdin, Magical Quest, Goof Troop, among others. Because they already perfected the formula on how to make those type of games amazing. Their market wasn't hardcore gamers looking for a challenge, it was kids! Sure, never had scratching moments here and there, but overall, the difficulty balance was great! The Lion King, on the other hand, was developed by Virgin Interactive, and whether you know, they were acquired by Viacom and Blockbuster. Ah, there it is! Virgins! This purchase took place in 1994, the same year the movie came out, so it almost feels like they made their game first and Blockbuster said, Yeah, this is good and all, but uh, where's the money on it? And I bet it sure worked. There's also another side to the story. Who here remembers the local arcade? Not me. The arcades were kind of funky in my area. Arcades didn't really have arcade games. They just had Super Nintendos installed inside and you didn't insert coins for a round. 
you insert a coins for a time trial. So you put in a coin and have like 5 minutes to play, so you better make the best of the change after buying the groceries. But if you have actual arcades, mostly DDR and Mortal Kombat, but over in the US, oh boy, there's a reason why Street Fighter always came out to arcades first. Kids just flock to play whatever the hell, mostly fighting games of course, and Pac-Man. But just like with rentals, arcades were also guilty of artificially increasing the difficulty just to screw you over your money. Oh, you wanna beat in Bison? Well, ask money for cash because this AI became self-aware. This went for pretty much all type of genres, like 2D shooters, racing games, rail shooters, and beat-em-ups. Surprisingly, puzzle games weren't as unforgiving, just, you know, annoying. Even still, unless you foreplay with your local arcade, um, there was going to be only one difficulty. No. Arcades had no mercy, of course. They weren't made so kids would have fun. They were a business, and they were created so the first stage or two were accessible, but then you had to work for it. Consoles didn't have a better translator, though. The ports for consoles. There were so many. Not all of them, but when a port was great, they could be even better than the original. How many times you heard the phrase, Yeah, man, I totally lost my virginity to throws in time. Surprisingly, not zero. And UN Squadron. It's quite unbelievable that the SNES version looks even better than the arcade. And even plays better with more weapon options and a map to choose your own missions. There's so many improvements. At least they have difficulty options. Some games just kept the stupid high difficulty for no reason. Sure, some games have the nail biting as their main personality, but for the rest, guys, we already gave you the money. I'm not gonna give you more money for extra lives. It ends up feeling like such a waste of time, especially with limited continues. I guess that's their way of extending a game if by itself is short, but again, Trolls in Time only has 9 levels and it's one of the most replayable games in existence. Thanks to the multiplayer, sublime controls and one playable Michelangelo plus 3 others. So when it comes to those mishandled games, I don't know what part of Homeport they didn't get. Probably the me part. Thankfully technology kept improving and consoles could handle arcade graphics much easier, so it became normal that console versions were basically improvements on the arcade. One of my favorites was Metal Slug X for the PS1. It's just the same game but with infinite continues when you look at that. And also you don't go back to a checkpoint where you continue, you just spawn right there and keep going. The only thing you miss is the score, but we're not in arcade, are we? That's right. With the coming of later generation of consoles, difficulty started to change. Sure, there was a game with difficulty options here and there, but most games just had this safe difficulty. Which is good if you wish to focus only on the story, but having a challenge comes like a breath of fresh air, and we all know which franchises to thank for that. That's right, Hollow Knight. It's great that current franchises have this more design where developers not only have to create a living world, but also how to balance it and make it fun, and the player feels satisfaction of going through the story at their own pace. Mostly. Now, remember what I said a minute ago? Guys, we already gave you the money. I'm not gonna give you more money for extra life. We all know those companies that you want to make the game as poorly designed, annoying, and difficult as possible, just so you have to pay more to even come close to advance a little bit and not even have a glimpse of fun. It's all about feeling that you didn't waste your money by buying it and not waste time when you get to a roadblock so you keep cashing in because they offer a solution to a problem that they created. Even with that sour note, I'm glad that some companies, including the indie ones, still believe in the value of a challenging game without a need to screw over the player. Less like an arcade game and more like a home port made by Konami or Capcom. Just a thought experiment, but can you imagine if they made a game that mixes the jump pack from Castlevania with the enemy placement of Ninja Gaiden, but amplify the jump pack so it always takes you to the nearest hole no matter how far it is? Oh man, better be careful next time. I'm actually enjoying this, what the hell's wrong with me? I went on a surprisingly long tangent about the arcades even though I didn't have one growing up, imagine if I did. <laughs>